I wanted to make a brief video, and it's very brief, about Margaret Cavendish, who will be reading next week. Now, there is nothing brief about Margaret Cavendish herself. Uh, my little subtitle here, voluminous and voluble and before her time, I think describes her pretty well. Now, she is an astonishing character by any, any measure whatsoever. But Cavendish is one of a couple of women who were writing during the Civil War and immediately after the Civil War, during the Restoration period, who defy all of our expectations about women and publication and public speech. She also defies our expectation about women and science and women and public discourse. So she is an astonishing character. And what you have within the Norton Anthology is an extraordinarily fragmentary representation of her whole work. Now, she published 13 volumes worth of work. Her first book of uh, poems and fancies has an extraordinary number of poems in it. And the poems stretch across all sorts of different areas. The poems engage ideas about cosmology and physics and atomic theory and fairies and respond to other writers. She wrote drama and she wrote prose fiction. And so the elements that you have inside of the anthology are places in her poetry where she addresses the question of what it means for a woman to speak and to publish and to write. But also you have a, a selection from The Blazing World, which is her incredible and wacky and wonderful piece of prose fiction that many people describe as an early work of science fiction. Now, what you have in front of you here is an example of the frontispiece from the plays that are never before printed. Now, she printed material in her lifetime she was an extraordinarily young woman when she was sent um, to court, to the, the court in exile in Oxford um, during the Civil War period, and she became a lady-in-waiting to Queen Henrietta. And when Charles I uh, was finally held captive and eventually executed and Queen Henrietta went into exile, then Margaret Cavendish, who was not yet Margaret Cavendish, went into exile along with her. And as a young woman, she became involved with William Cavendish, who was a poet and courtier and governor uh, and politician and royalist, who was uh, 31 years her elder. And so, you know, there are some parallels that we can make with Amelia Lanier of, you know, a young sort of uh, woman who may be a bit of a, a prodigy or a young bloomer in terms of poetic and intellectual capability becoming associated with a much, much older man. But Cavendish enabled and supported all of her poetic and creative and scientific ventures. And so, this piece um, has a, a, just a magnificent representation of Cavendish. And I, I wanted us to look at this because I think it's so amazing. One of the things that she was chastised for in her own period was her ego and her vanity. And when I look at this, I think of what astonishing courage and chutzpah she had to have in order to represent herself as the great artist and not only the great artist, but as someone who can be associated with all of this incredible iconography, right? Notice on the left, she's got Perseus, right? And we've got the, the, the image of the Gorgon, right? Medusa on the shield, right? Um, and I just realized that may not be Perseus, that may be Achilles, I don't know. On the right, you know, she's got an example of, I'm, I'm pretty certain that that's Apollo who is over on her right because he's got the 
the the uh, the poet's crown of, of leaves and he's got a harp and he's got a son right and so here she is right uh, just oh actually I think on the left we may have Diana right but so here she is like being represented as a woman who is of kind of classical importance right now I blew up the um, the the pedestal so that you can see it right and and see sort of what she says about herself right here on this figure cast a glance but so as if it were by chance your eyes not fixed they must not stay since this like shadows to the day it only represents for still her beauty is found beyond the skill of the best painter to embrace those lovely lines within her face view her soul's picture judgment wit then read those lines which she hath writ by fancy's pencil drawn alone which peace but she can justly own right so here cavendish is with this public declaration that her work is her own right so i think that she's an amazing figure in terms of what she suggests about the possibility of women claiming ownership over their art now, uh, like I've said a couple of times, what you have before you in the anthology is pretty fragmentary. So I wanted to provide you with two poems from Poems and Fancies, right? We have um, the poetess's hasty resolution at the, at the beginning of our section, as well as the hunting of the hare. Um, but I also want to include these two poems. Partial, now, the one on the right, the world in an earring, is uh, a fragment. It's only the first 16 lines, but the one on the left is complete. Right? And so I want us to look at this. Some learned men, which think to reason well, say light and color in the brain do dwell. That motion in the brain all light doth give, and if no brain, the world in dark would live. But be it that the brain hath eyes to see, then eyes and brain would make the light to be. If so, poor Dunn was out when he did say, if all the world were blind, twould still be day. Say they then, there no light in the air would reign, unless you'll grant the world were one great brain. Some age and some opinions doth agree, the next doth strive to make them false to be, for what is new doth all so pleasing sound, that reasons old are as mere nonsense found. But all opinions are by fancy fed, and truth lies under those opinions dead. Now, we can quibble about the quality of the verse, right? This is in couplets, it's 16 lines long, it's got a, a, an alternating meter that is uh, pretty squarely, um, uh, pretty squarely alternating. Right, there are very few multisyllabic words, so we don't have a whole lot of complexity in the verse. But I want you to take a moment and consider the intellectual complexity of this. Right, here she is, and she is advancing a really significant phenomenological point. Right, what does it mean for us to interact with light? What does it mean for us to understand and interact with the world? Is the world just one great brain? Right, this is a pretty amazing metaphysical philosophical point that she's advancing now in poetry. Now we see the same kind of thing over on the right, the world in an earring. An earring may well a zodiac be, wherein a sun goes round which we not see, and planet seven about that sun may move, and he stands still as learned men would prove and fixed stars like twinkling diamonds placed about this earring which a world is vast that same which doth the earring hold the whole is that we call the north and southern pole their nipping frosts may be and winter's cold yet never on the lady's ear take hold and lightning thunder and great winds may blow within this earring yet the ear not know fish there may swim in seas which ebb and flow and islands be wherein do spices grow their crystal rocks hang dangling at each ear, and golden mines as jewels may they wear. Right? So 
think about this and think about something like the adventure the avengers right and the quantum realm right here she's imagining a piece of matter that might itself be like a universe right and notice also that she's describing a heliocentric universe right whereas dunn used the ptolemaic universe that was left over from the classical period and uh, the medieval period in her universe the sun is the is the piece that is uh, standing still as learned men have proved right so she is an extraordinary figure and has significance to us not only because of her role as a woman who is directly engaging in publishing and public speech but she's also important as an intellectual and and one of the things that i would like you to keep in mind is that every single writer that we have read all this period in this entire class has a whole constellation of things that they were doing that had really important cultural outcomes right so just as shakespeare is writing his poetry and writing his drama he's also doing some really interesting things in terms of property ownership in stratford upon avon and and becoming a shareholder in a theater that is creating a, a business model of a corporation that is generating value right think about someone like sir philip sydney who is a courtier who is trying to advance himself and perhaps even wind up being a colonial governor but also don't forget that mary sydney has a laboratory that's set up at her house right where she is trying to learn the new emerging science of chemistry so all of these different people are not only writers but they are intellectuals and they are agents in their world and what we're coming across is one fragment of that thank you